Okay, so, you guys having a good time? Yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't been as excited about a camp like this since 2005. And, uh, you know, Roland was there and Jimmy was there and it was a, it was a, it was a camp that uh, I and a student of uh, Bob Quinn's, his name was D. Childress, put on. And we had a number of masters in there and it was just rock and roll from uh, the very, from the get-go. And there's something special that I wanted to do today and I, I, and I wanted to break up the training because it's very, very easy to get into information overload. And uh, so instead of, you know, okay, now we're going to do this move, that move, and the next move, it's kind of, okay, let's chill out, let's relax, let's uh, get our minds going in a different uh, direction. And the direction that I want to go over is, what is modern Arnis? And I think this is especially a good point since this is the 20th anniversary of Professor Remy's death. Now, first thing is, okay, who am I to, to deliver a dissertation on what is modern RNS? So I'm just going to give you just very, very brief credentials. And uh, if my head starts to swell, then, then, then back out the camera just a little bit so you can fit my entire head into this. But when I met Professor Remy, I was already a four-time national karate champion. Uh, my nickname was Super Dan. I was known. I found out later throughout the world, not throughout the country. I found out later in the 80s that people knew me as Super Dan in uh, uh, you know, not only Canada, but Europe and so forth, which you know, is quite gratifying. But I had 14 years of world-class skills under my belt, and then I met Professor Remy. And it, and Janet and I were talking about uh, timing. Sometimes when the right thing comes into your life, it, it's also it's perfectly timed because I was heading into the end of my competitive career and it was like, okay, sort of kind of what next? I was a karate jock and I was a voracious studier of martial arts history, but practitioner wise, I was a karate jock. And then I met Professor Remy and as I've said to many, many people in the past, he opened up the world because there was a lot to martial arts that I did not know about despite my skills that he knew about. And he was the key, in, key person for my transformation from being a karate jock to a martial artist. Okay, now, so for the 21 years since I met him, he was my sole teacher in Modern Arnis. And uh, I was a seminar rat, and I use that term lovingly. I went to seminar, 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 because he didn't have uh, a home dojo. He didn't have a centralized dojo. He did not have a linear curriculum. You know, what we had was we had the list that was at the camps, and everybody did the same thing, and you either moved up to the next belt rank, or, if the professor was putting you up for black, then you put, put you up for black, but you did the same thing that everybody else did. You just either did it better, faster, stronger, or whatever. So, now, this year, this summer, marks the 20th anniversary of Professor Remy's death. And that's the keynote thrust of this camp. It's like, you know, I, I, I see people from different eras, I see a lot of you guys I don't know, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm really pleased to see you guys here. There are several people who are old timers that I had never met. I finally got to meet Bruce Chu. I finally got to meet Larry Roca. You know, guys who are household names in modern Arnis, but our paths always, you know, like two ships passing, didn't happen. So when I look, when I look at Arnis, I look at it uh, in, let's say, a comparative. Now, one can look at Arnis, let's say, as uh, you know, how it relates to another art painting. Well, maybe to them, uh, Arnis is like Rockwell. Maybe it's like Jackson Pollock. I mean, how, how does it 
how does it jive to the person? With me, it's music. To me, Arnis is jazz. Now, when I look at jazz, when you listen to jazz and you look at the entire spectrum of jazz, what you have is you have rhythm, you have flow, you have innovation, you have improvisation, you have steady beat, you have syncopated beat, you have all of this that goes here and there. God, I'm starting to get animated. I just, I, I just love it. But to me, it's jazz. And especially when you start getting into the free flow, man, that's where you start singing. That's where you start singing. And if you look at all the different drills that we have done, okay, to me they are tunes you've learned, chord progressions, they are your scales so that you can sit down and whether you're a guitar, trumpet, piano, you can play. And then when you get good, ah, oh, you play a duet. And now you're, you're playing off of somebody else and this is just, it's utterly fascinating to me. Now, how many here have not, have not listened to Miles Davis? Anybody not listen to Miles Davis? Okay. Thank you. You have not lived a full life. You have not lived a complete life, in my estimation. Miles Davis, he changed the face of jazz no less than five times during his lifetime. Now, if you think about any pop singer or country singer or whatever who changes the direction of the genre during their lifetime, let's say, let's take Garth Brooks, okay, country. Uh, incredible, incredible performer. From everything I see, wonderful human being, he has not changed the face of country five times. The Beatles, maybe twice. First when they were the, uh, the little mop tops and doing pop music that was based on uh, American R&B. And then when they got into their psychedelic era and they started spacing out. Okay, that's two times. Miles Davis, five times. Remy Presses, to me, is the Miles Davis of modern Arnis, or, or of Arnis. Now, when we talk about, and I'm gonna go back and forth between jazz and Arnis to really tie them together. But when we talk about, let's say, Miles changing the face of jazz, in the 1940s, what was prevalent was bebop. Now, bebop is fast. It is complex harmonies, complex rhythm, bah, 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 bah. speed, Art Tatum, Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, Wah! just ripping and tearing. 19, 19, uh, 1950, Miles puts together like this, it's either seven piece or uh, nine piece, I can't remember but starts putting out smooth, relaxed, what, what people think is like West Coast jazz. And it's just, it calms stuff down. And people start shifting towards that. I think the most notable proponent is a fellow by the name of Chet Baker, who played this smooth jazz. Well, Miles was before him. Miles sat it out. There's an album called The Birth of the Cool. And it took jazz and it went off in this direction. Then, he shifts from that to what is called hard bop. Now, hard bop is different than bebop in that it incorporates gospel rhythms, rhythm and blues rhythms, blues-based, and a you know, tiny bit of free form, not much. But we're off of this smooth thing into back into this little harder edge thing, but you're starting to hear certain things that you're familiar with if you listen to other music. This is with his first great quintet, who most notably uh, he had with him on uh, uh, alto and soprano sax, uh, uh, John Coltrane. And most jazz people sit back, ah, oh, train, you better believe it. Yeah. But it's the next shift that really I want to tie in with what Remy Presses did, and that is and I'm jumping modal jazz from uh, Kind of Blue, which is probably the best uh, known Miles album because I still can't come up with a layman's term of modal jazz. I can, I can hear it, 
but every, every definition I read, I cannot translate it into layman's terms that somebody else would understand. So I'm going to bypass the most important album that was ever produced in jazz to go to his next section. And that was 1968, he started introducing electric instruments into his jazz model. And it started off with, in a silent way, it moved there drastically to Bitch's Brew. It turns harder rock into a tribute to Jack Johnson and then starts incorporating funk in On the Corner, these four albums. Now, the fascinating thing is that on the album cover, and this is really significant in the comparison, on the album cover of In a Silent Way, it has a line in there, New Directions in Music by Miles Davis. Now, one thing Miles didn't like he hated people calling his music jazz because it pigeonholed it. He didn't pigeonhole his music as jazz. Everybody else would call it jazz. And genre-wise, yeah, it, it fit into jazz. But Miles being conceptual, he didn't think in terms of jazz. He thought in terms of music. And the influences that were coming in at the time, okay, it's 1968. Things start becoming more electrified. He starts pulling in the electric piano. He starts pulling in the electric guitar and so forth. And while In a Silent Way was a very subtle shift, Bitch's Brew was a dead punch to the face. Now, new directions in music. Let's shift back over to Remy Presses. Now, Remy Presses. It's pretty well known that, you know, his start in Filipino martial arts is World War II. The family moves up into the mountains and dad is teaching the Filipino guerrillas, guerrilla uh, 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 fighters. And young Remy, you know, he's watching, he's five or six, he's fascinated. He goes and he pulls a switch off the tree and he starts imitating the movements, you know, the side by side and the figure eight. And he's whacking all the leaves and he's beating all the leaves off the tree and that sort of thing. His grandfather catches him. Probably wasn't hard to catch him. I mean, everything within reach is knocked down the, to the ground. He says, Remy, do you want to learn our NIS? Yes. Okay, I will teach you. Now, so Remy starts learning from his grandfather and I, I won't go as far as saying that he learned the Pressus family art because I cannot find anything in writing that says something is the Pressus family art. But my thinky think, and I'll, I'll label opinion at any point in time when I think it's opinion and I can't back it up, but my thinky think is grandpa taught, taught dad and dad taught others and Remy spied on dad and that's how he started learning. But he did learn from his granddad. And uh, earlier, when uh, Brian was out there and you saw me waving a book, okay, I have all this cataloged in the book that I brought, and I want to, uh, special tip of the hat to Joe Robello, who is sitting, you can't see him, he's off camera, but he's right this way. Uh, his interview with Remy Pressus, the last uh, videoed interview with Re Remy Pressus was one of the sources of Remy's history in his own words. So I'm not taking somebody else's writing, somebody else's article, we're talking. I got the interview, I had it transcribed, and then with headphones on, I corrected the transcription so we had word by word along with another interview, which is like maybe an hour and a half, just about drove myself blind doing it. <laughs> but it was a labor of love, so I did it anyway, to come out with a linear timeline of Professor Remy's uh, uh, upbringing, his training, and so forth. So we all know that he uh, trained with his grandfather. This is uh, verified in many other sources. He moves to Cebu or uh, goes over to Cebu, he's 14 years old, goes over with, I think, a cousin or friend of his, I can't remember. And then he hooks up with the next source 
of Filipino martial art, which is Balinta Wakaskrema. And what is interesting in his accounting of meeting with Rodolfo Moncal is him saying, they cannot catch me. I am moving, I am slashing, I will not stand, I do not stand still. Okay, what is he doing? He's doing, as Uncle Bram would say, a cutting art. He's moving, he's angling. Balintawak, a bit more of a forward, backward, stick dueling system. They like him because he's got guts. From 1950 to 1957, he trains in Balintawak Eskrema. First learns under uh, Rodolfo Moncal, graduates to uh, Timoteo Moranga, finally graduates to the founder of Balintawak, Anchan Bakon. And while he's doing this, you know, obviously he's gaining the skills, but the fascinating thing is the bedrock of what he has is also the blade art. Interesting marriage, interesting marriage. Now, uh, in 1957, he decides for a couple of, you know, for one life-saving reason and probably for other reasons, but one life-saving reason, he's leaving Cebu. And a fascinating thing is, in 1957, remember I talk about Miles Davis, new directions in music. In 1957, he has a vision of where he wants to go with this already. I'm five years old, he knows where he wants to go. He tells his teacher, when I start teaching, I am not going to teach your system. I am not going to teach stick fighting. I'm gonna teach for physical, physical education and self-defense. They part on good terms, Remy leaves. Now, New Directions in Music by Miles Davis, New Directions in Arnis by Remy Presses. Okay, running a parallel path. So, if he's going into new directions, what was the old direction? Oh, that was interesting. Interesting research. I have uh, an essay uh, in the book by Krishna Gadhanya who is not a modern Arnis person, talking about Filipino duels. And Arnis, to be very uh, kind about it, had a bad rep. Arnis Eskreme had bad PR. Dock workers, ruffians, uh, bodyguards, basically roughneck and thugs. That's who did Arnis. That's, 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 that's the PR. What was the huge uh, martial arts in the Philippines? Karate, Judo, Taekwondo. How come? Well, they were clean. Everybody dressed the same. All had the white jammies. They had the belt. They had the curriculum. They all did the same thing at the same time. Whoom, whoom, whoom. Things were organized. Much more palatable than guys with sticks and knives who were gonna put a noggin conk on you if they didn't like you. Now, also, what was it used for? Okay, it was used for either dueling or fighting. I mean, and when I say dueling or fighting, I mean dueling or fighting. Um, Anchan Bakon, founder of Balintawak, went to prison for killing somebody. Dead on a doornail. Uh, Antonio Illustrissimo, Tatang. He had several certified kills under his belt. There is a uh, book by uh, Dave Gould on Lameco Escrema, talking about the founder, Jose Caballero. And this is a misquote. I've got a real quote into the book. This is not a, a, a not my normal cheesy joking uh, sales pitch. I've just got the actual quote. But he's talking about when you're practicing, if you're not practicing your stro each strike hard enough to break somebody's skull, then why do it? That was Arnis at the time. Now, 1957, Remy's gonna take a left turn at Albuquerque, 
he loves the art, he's going to figure out a way to clean up the art. So, what does he do? He goes back to his hometown. He actually starts a school. Then, he goes back into Manila at the urging of, uh, I believe, a mayor, if I remember right. See, the nice thing is I've got it all written down. I have to remember a dadgum thing. But he gets into the school system. Now, the fascinating thing is, in order to get into the school system, he first had to teach judo. And he had to sneak Arnis in under the rug. But by this time, he has a curriculum. The book that you're about to receive, many, many people do not know this. Those are the requirements for first grade black in modern Arnis. I've had this verified by three independent sources. One in the Philippines, two in the United States. He actually has a curriculum. Uh, he has organization. Okay, he has the 12 basic strikes, which I will bet dollars to donuts. He lifted from Balintawak a Squamish because when I did Balintawak, they were almost identical, except he had three and four reversed. He had six and seven reversed. But there was a numerical system, and one of the things that Mark Wiley uh, had so artfully noted in uh, an interview with Dean Franco on FMA discussion was that. He had exact blocks for exact strikes, exact disarms for exact strikes. I mean, he actually had set up a curriculum. Okay? This hadn't been done before. And he was pushing more towards self-defense as opposed to stick fighting. Now, when I, when I look at uh, uh, self-defense and I look at fighting, those are two different animals. With me, self-defense is protection. With fighting, let's get down. Let's, let's party because it's, this is gonna turn out really unfortunate for somebody. You get in there because you either like it or you're bully or, 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 or. Well, he had enough of that. And trust me, he had been in a number of rumbles. I've got several that are actually outlined in the book. And he was, he was a little bit of a roughneck and thug as well. Uh, there was a quote I just read recently, and dad gummit, if I had found it before the book, I would have put it in the book where he had stated that uh, he was starting to get a reputation that if you wanted to train with him, you had to fight. And he wanted to change that rep. So, he's taking this art, which the underlying bedrock is survival and he wants to shift it. New directions in Arnis, just like new directions in music. Now, he comes to the United States. Okay, that is cataloged history. If you, wanna, if, if you want to briefly state the history of Remy Pressis in the United States, it was he went here and did a seminar, he went here and did a camp, and he went here and did a seminar, and he took a break for two weeks and he went here and did a seminar. And you do that for 21 years and you have basically got the history of Remy Presses. Now, this is not talking about these are the developments because modern artists developed as he was in the States and went through various stages. And I have those outlined as well. So I'm not gonna go through those, but the thing that I look at when I, when I make the comparison between Miles Davis and Remy Presses. I'm going to go back to Miles. Now, you had this period of time where Miles was creating jazz rock. The critics had to come up with a term just to describe it because it was new music. At a certain point, a number of his key sidemen left him and formed their own bands. One of the very first right off the bat, Tony Williams. Puts together Tony Williams' lifetime. So he's got himself, he's got Larry Young on organ, and he's got uh, John McLaughlin on guitar, and they were loud, and they were energetic, and they were poorly recorded, but they were savage. You get Herbie Hancock. He comes up with a septet first of more freeform African music, Mwandishi, then he slides over into funk jazz. Headhunters. 
Joe Zawinul and Wayne Shorter. Joe Zawinul was the only person who actually wrote tunes that were included on Bitch's Brew. He was a keyboard player from Por uh, Poland. Wayne Shorter was in his second great quintet. They teamed together to form their own music, Weather Report. Joe Zawinul is quoted. You know, so what category are we in? We're a Weather Report. That's, that's the music we play. He called himself Jazz Rock. He called himself Weather Report. Uh, Chick Corea forms Return to Forever, a much slicker form than, let's say, the Mahavishnu Orchestra, where I'll get to next, but he's got his own thing. John McLaughlin, speed guitarist par excellence, forms the Mahavishnu Orchestra, okay? Then you get Billy Cobham, who did not come up with any particular uh, name for his band other than him, Billy Cobham. And who were these guys? They often referred to themselves as the children of Miles. They came out of the Miles Davis lineage. And we have these very original types of jazz rock under their heading, but they came from Miles and they never called themselves jazz. It's 20 years since Remy passed. So who are the children of Remy? Okay. I'll start with me. I'm a child of Remy. I was a direct student for 21 years. I have a, uh, an, agreed, an agreed upon by Remy, a subset of modern Arnis that I just call the MA-80 system, Arnis Escrema. You see that uh, Brian's got actually my shirt. I've got Brian's shirt on, he's got my shirt on. Okay, good, there's Tony Williams' lifetime. Then you've got Brian Zawalinski, the art within your art. Oh, you got Herbie Hancock over here. Then you have Arnis International. We have Bruce Chu. Oh, we've got the Mahavishnu Orchestra over here. You've got Tim Hartman. Precious Arnis. Oh, you got Billy Cobham over here. You have the children of Remy. And what are we all doing? We're all doing our own versions of modern Arnis. We're all doing our own versions of modern Arnis. Whether we strictly state that, yes, this is modern Arnis, or this is the art within your art, or this is Arnis International, or this is Precious Arnis, or, or, or. This is where the art continues. Now, one of the earliest students in the United States, Bruce Jutnick, and I could just kill him for this, only because he thought of it and I didn't. Quote, he said, if you want to preserve the art, preserve the spirit. And those of us who train with Professor Remy, Janet and I were talking about it, uh, uh, when, we're, when we're not digging at each other, Bruce and I have talked about it, and Roland and those of us who've been taught by Remy Pressus know exactly what we're talking about as far as preserving the spirit. Exactly what we're talking about as far as preserving the spirit. So, this is my question. What is modern Arnis? Now, hi, what's your name, dear? Brianna. Brianna? How old are you? 18. How long have you been doing modern Arnis? Less than five years. You are modern Arnis. How long have you been doing modern Arnis? Say again? Seven-ish years. Seven-ish years, yeah. You are modern Arnis. And you're modern Arnis. And you are modern Arnis. And you all are modern Arnis. This is where the art is heading. So there have been a couple of terms that have been introduced into the lexicon that and we're gonna go into personal opinion. They've been introduced. Uh, one has been the concept of a first generation student. And there have been different definitions of first generation student or how you can work up to being a first generation student. Bobby Tabuata just recently had answered uh, a statement by Issing Atilio on YouTube and he made a very, very poignant point. 
when I trained with the old masters, there was no talk of first generation. And I'm sitting back and I'm going, you know, I never, had, I never heard Professor Remy ever say anything about first generation. The, fast, the, the closest thing he might have said about first generation would be, and I'm going to take Dieter Knudel uh, as an example. Dieter's a great friend of mine. He's in Germany. He would say something like, uh, oh, uh, Dieter, he's, he studied to my brother Ernesto, but now he's steady with me. And that's all he would say. Oh, he started with Ernesto, but now he's mine. Remy, if nothing else, was in Inclusive. See, I was talking with Ty. Now, Ty, uh, he originally studied with Eric Alexander. Now, I know Eric Alexander because I fought him twice in karate tournaments, and he came after me like I owed him money. I mean, I mean, he 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 he, he, he wanted some skin, and it was mine. And I won against him twice, but uh, I mean, they were wars. Now, he started with Eric, so was he a first-generation student of uh, Professor Remy's? Well. I asked him, so who's your instructor? He's Professor Remy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Doesn't matter where you started because the old man accepted you. Didn't matter where you started. Didn't matter whether you started some other escrima art. You never started in a escrima or, or artist like me. I was just a karate jock, like I said. He accepted you. You were his. So I don't buy into the first generation talk. It's too easy to prop oneself up while pushing another down by using that. And Remy never said it. Now, another term that's been introduced in the lexicon has been the term derivative. Now, any of you guys who might know me is, I am just wicked mad on exact definitions, which I'll give you the exact definition uh, that Remy Presses did because I told you very, very early that there's only one time that I ever saw that he gave you a definition. However, but I'll do that in a moment. Uh, term derivative. Okay, if it's a noun, I've got it written right here. If it's a noun, it is, quote, something that is based on another source. Well, in the words of my buddy Bruce Chu, bang! <laughs> We're all based on another source. We're all derivative. Whether we are modernists or we're Tawa or whatever, we're based on Remy. And as uh, uh, when I was talking with Ty, I says, yeah, Remy's derivative. Yes, he is, because he was taught by granddad and he was taught by his three Balintawak instructors and any other influence, including Kakoi Kanyate, because he loved Kakoi's twirling, so he ripped off that twirling. That's in Joe's interview. And he ripped off anybody that he could find because he was a sponge. And I'll tell you right now, if you knew the guy before he met Professor Wally J, and then after he met Professor Wally J, all of a sudden the, the joint locks got in really nastier a lot faster. Yeah, but he was a sponge that way. So we were all derivative. But the fascinating thing is, did he ever use that term? No. We, um, today we are going to study the, uh, what is this? The modern artist. It is the, the art of the Philippines. And then he, that's all he would say. So, any definitions, now this is going to be a, 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 a Dan opinion, accept or reject as you will. If you're my student, you have to accept it wholeheartedly and you can't question it. But <laughs> that's my school, that's how I roll. But, uh, the only way that he described this was Karate International Magazine, May, June, issue 1989. The question was, what is the difference between modern arnis and regular arnis? The answer, I'm going to speak in Dan language. I'm not going to try and do a Remy on this. Well, it is like in America because you had mathematics. Today you have modern mathematics. Modern arnis is more practical, easier, and flexible. That is why it is called modern arnis. There is a system, there are rules to follow. It is like today you have modern English and modern mathematics. It is a simplified system that teachers, that teachers know how to use both, the stick or the same techniques, empty-handed. It is a very effective martial arts system, end 
quote. Okay. To me, that's modern earnest. As a personal opinion, I accept nobody else's definition because nobody else is the founder. Now, if Bruce is going to give me a definition of Arnis International, I will, I will accept that 100% because that's Arnis International. If I give you a definition of, of the MA-80 system, Arnis Escrema, okay, that's my definition. That's not Remy's definition of his art, that now my art is an offshoot or off branch or a continuation of. But when we take, when we take a look at, and I'm going to wrap up here, and then we might get to some physical if we've got enough time. If we take a look at what he did, there was this art that was not well thought of in the Philippines that he went bang, left turn at Albuquerque. Why he loved the art. He did not love what he saw was occurring with the art, which was Taekwondo, Karate, and Judo outplaying this wonderful uh, uh, martial art. Okay, more people were doing that. There was this indigenous art that he loved. It had a bad rep. He wanted it to continue. And here's an interesting thing, and any of us old timers know this. At the end of your very first seminar, what did he tell us to do? Now you teach. You've done a three hour seminar. You've only learned the 12 basic strikes. You learned the brace block. Oh, now you go to your school and you teach. Yeah, he wasn't worried about curriculum form or is this the right angle, blah, blah, blah. He was worried about the continuation of the art, the propagation of the art. It's almost like you go teach, I'll smooth you guys out later. And of course, we geeky Americans who grew up on the elementary school 12 grade system, good. We start doing the curriculum in a uh, uh, consecutive basis or cumulative basis, that sort of thing, in a graduated basis, okay. He wasn't concerned with that. That was modern earnest. Now, we all have the curriculums in place. I've got mine, Bruce's got his, Roland's got his, Ty's got his. Uh, so all of this is in place. Now, it's like uh, what Hanchi Bruce had said, if you want to preserve the art, preserve the spirit. This camp, boy oh boy, this, this camp lives up to that concept, preserve the spirit. I think better than anybody. You watch, you watch us move. You watch Janet, Roland, myself, Bram, Bruce. You watch us move, you'll see a connecting thread we won't all necessarily move the same, but we don't move that different, okay? And the attitudes of each of the instructors without us sitting down and talking about it has been preserve the spirit. So, we're the old buzzards. If you guys want to preserve the art, preserve the spirit. You guys, because you're modern artists, I think you told me you're a beginner, am I right? Yeah, well you are modern artist. How long have you trained? Couple of months. Couple of months. Well, you're as much modern artist as I am. And I've been at it for 41 years. 56 years if you count overall martial arts. I think I'm older than some of you have been alive. But that's another video, that's another tape. So anyway, the question, what is modern artist? This all comes out from an FMA Chronicles uh, episode that Tim Hartman and uh, Ty Botting host. And Tim had mentioned one time that, uh, in there that you know, he and Ty are voices, not the voices, but are voices of modern artists. And if anybody else had something they want to say, agreements, disagreements, comments, etc., speak up. So I kind of went, Okay, baby. You ask Super Dan to speak up. You can't get Super Dan to shut up. But however much this runs parallel or diverts off or whatever, that and five bucks will get you a good cup of coffee because the idea is if you're going to preserve the art, preserve the spirit. This is my opinion, and this is coming from uh, for better or for worse, the village elder, 
People in modern earnest, call, uh, you'll, you'll hear uh, Brian call me Uncle Dan. You hear Renee uh, Tongson from the Philippines. Uncle Dan, Manong Dan. It's, it's a position, you know, it doesn't necessarily elevate me, it's just, yeah, it's, it's nice, it's like, but it's like, yeah, one of the old buzzards. And I'm the oldest buzzard here in terms of modern Arness. You know, I, I've got uh, Brian beat by a couple of months. I got Brian beat by about a half a year. But this is coming from an Uncle Dan perspective. So I hope you've rested. And when we get on to the next training thing, I hope you're refreshed. I'm going to post this up on YouTube, available to everyone, so that if you want to re-listen, recheck into it, and so forth, you can. So, thank you very much for your very, very patient attention. End of lecture. <laughs>